Right, Excellency, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon and welcome. I hope everyone is doing well and excited for our lecture this afternoon. My name is Afni and I will be the MC for today's event. Today we have here with us His Excellency Vincent Piquet, Ambassador of the European Union to Indonesia. Welcome Ambassador, how are you? All right. Ladies and gentlemen, building a climate neutral, green, fair, and social Europe is one of the EU's key objectives, according to its 2019-2024 strategic agenda. Accordingly, EU has come up with several initiatives to achieve net zero by 2050, as agreed in the Paris Agreement. Against this backdrop, we will be listening from Ambassador Piquet on EU's Green Deal for net zero, state of play, and why we are not banning palm oil. Today's lecture will be moderated by Ibu Reni Mirianti. She is researcher in Sudirman Center of Global Studies, the head of thesis commission in International Relations Department, Career Development Center team of Social and Political Faculty of Universitas General Sudirman, as well as lecturer of international relations. Welcome Ibu Reni. Thank you, Mbak we would like to welcome all students who are joining in the Zoom meeting, and we would like to also recognize the students from Universitas General Sudirman. Welcome everybody, and also thank you to our participants who are turning in on our YouTube channel. Before we start, don't forget to share your moments with us from this lecture by tagging at FPC Indo and at uni underscore Europa on your social media posts. Ladies and gentlemen, let us now begin today's discussion. Please welcome the moderator, Ibu Reni. Ibu Reni, the screen is yours. Okay, uh, thank you, Mbak Afni. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, we have a good session today. Uh, good afternoon, His Excellency Vincent uh, Pickett. And uh, good afternoon for uh, FPCI committee. Mbak Afni, uh, Akmal, and also Renaldi. And uh, for ladies and gentlemen, uh, and all participants uh, from uh, mostly from General Sudirman University, good afternoon, uh, my beloved students. Okay. Uh, today, uh, in this afternoon, we have uh, Ambassador Lecture in cooperation uh, with the delegation of European Union uh, to Indonesia and Brunei Darussalam, His Excellency Vincent Pickett. Uh, the topic of uh, Ambassador Lecture today, uh, AU Screen Deal for Net Zero by 2050, uh, state, of, state of Play and Why We Are Not uh, Banning uh, Palm Oil. Uh, I have some notes uh, for this uh, session uh, before we start uh, our uh, session and presentation today. Uh, we suggest for the participants, uh, yeah, most of them are my students, uh, to turn on camera uh, during the session, so we will have a uh, yeah we will have a discussion uh, more interesting because uh, we have a, we you all of you some of you uh, turn on your camera and then uh, don't forget uh, to keep uh, yourself uh, mute uh, during the presentation and uh, as your information every uh, for all the participants uh, the FPCI committee would also provide uh, e certificate for uh, this uh, webinar. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, as mentioned before uh, by Mbak uh, Afni, yeah, related to uh, this issue, yeah, uh, we can begin now. Uh, and uh, the European, you know, uh, the European uh, Green Deal, uh, it's believed as the new strategy uh, that uh, will help uh, AU and then also uh, the world uh, to cut commission uh, while develop economic side uh, such as uh, creating jobs and then also uh, environmentally uh, friendly agriculture. Uh, and then uh, the issue of climate change uh, right now uh, is becoming of uh, an arch, uh, it's a global issues right now and uh, need to be addressed uh, immediately. Uh, climate change, greenhouse uh, gas emission, deforestation, and also uh, clean energy. And uh, as mentioned before, the AU introduced uh, the Green Deal Net Program Zero, uh, Green Pro, uh, Net Program Zero by uh, 2050 as an action plan uh, that uh, aims to achieve uh, natural emissions and then 
one of the pro cons, yeah, one of the issues uh, in the in this uh, implementation of uh, this uh, policy is related to the usage of uh, palm oil. And then uh, to know more about uh, this issue, uh, we have uh, Mr. Ambassador, His Excellency Vincent Pickett with us today. Hello, uh, are you with us, Mr. Uh, Ambassador? Thomas Yang, I am, in, in, I'm in, I am indeed. Very good okay. to see you, Ivo Reni. Selamat siang. And then uh, I'm Reni Mirianti. Uh, I will be the moderator uh, in this uh, webinar. And then uh, also uh, we will have uh, some uh, session before uh, with uh, some participant in this uh, webinar. And uh, so uh, to begin with, and then we don't have to uh, wait for a long time. And then uh, to know more and dig more about uh, this issue, uh, we will have uh, Ambassador, uh, His Excellency Vincent Pickett, uh, to Indone the Ambassador for AU to Indonesia, uh, and Brunei Darussalam. Uh, let's give uh, the floor to Ambassador Pickett uh, to give a presentation and then also uh, give uh, insightful uh, information uh, to us how far uh, the AU uh, and then also the current situation uh, related to uh, this issue to all the participants and then also uh, the students uh, uh, in this uh, webinar. Thank you. Uh, for Mr. Ambassador, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much indeed, uh, uh, Ibureni uh, Mirianti, lecturer at the Universitas General Sudirman. Um, great to see you here this afternoon and together with so many students of your department, international relations. And, and um, um, it's really a pleasure to be speaking to you at the Universitas General Sudirman because I feel sort of connected with you, even though I've never visited your university, because our office building here in Jakarta is uh, I'm in the third, on the 38th floor of, a, of, a, of an office tower, and the address is um, uh, uh, Jalan General Sudirman, number five. So <laughs> somehow, um, I uh, feel that I'm on the on the way to your university day in day out. So great to have you here for this um, informal afternoon. Um, I will of course uh, give a short presentation. I'll keep it as short as I can. I say that all the time, and it always turns out a, a bit longer than I intended. But bear with me, please. And after that, I do indeed look forward to having a discussion with, with you, with the students, uh, with any lectures that are present as well. Uh, greetings also to uh, the colleagues of uh, FPCI, Ma uh, uh, Afni and um, uh, ba, uh, Ray. Uh, FPCI is, is a fantastic partner for the um, EU. Uh, delegation in Indonesia for, for doing our outreach as, um, as uh, our public diplomacy, as we call it, and especially um, aimed at uh, young uh, generation in Indonesia. So great to see both of you, uh, Afni and, and Ray. I have some slides, 10 of them. So maybe we can um, start showing them. Um, who does that, uh, Afni? Is that you or is it's it okay. Ray? Or I'm is the same it... ambassador. Mm -hmm. Ah, okay. Right. Um, um, how do I uh, enlarge it then? View speaker. Yes. Okay. Uh, there we are. Uh, the topic of my um, talk is uh, is the EU's Green Deal and why we are not um, banning palm oil and uh, of course the the second part of the title is a little bit uh, uh, to meant uh, to uh, promote the discussion uh, there is a lot of this uh, discussion about this matter in the Indonesian public domain and I thought let me take the the bull by the horns by putting it up front but of course um, palm oil is only one 
topic in the midst of um, a, a whole spectrum of policy areas uh, that um, we have to face up to um, in uh, within the European Union's Green Deal. And the European Union Green Deal is, um, is not just an environmental or climate policy, it's a also an economic policy, it's a vision presented by the president of the European Commission, uh, Ursula von der Leyen, you see her photograph there, um, at the start of her mandate in 2019, a vision uh, to make the European economy, uh, but uh, also the European society, a net zero carbon society and economy, a circular economy, um, and a sustainable one in, in which, and what do we mean by that, circularity and sustainability, we main, may mean by that that we do not want to take more out of the uh, natural resources of, uh, of the earth uh, than we put into it or put back into it. Um, so sustainability means that uh, the earth is not being drained or is not being depleted of its uh, natural resources, but is uh, there to last uh, for a sustainable um, future. And now, how do you do that? Um, of course, um, it is uh, uh, it is about everything, uh, because at the end of the day, carbon is produced everywhere, and resources are being used and abused everywhere. So you talk about the way we produce, the way we uh, consume, uh, the way we um, travel, um, the way we um, live uh, and build houses, uh, and the way we pollute um, uh, and, and produce um, in factories. So it's a very complex uh, um, policy um, campaign uh, that I think is very nicely summarized by this honeycomb uh, um, picture that you see on your screen on your screen there. You've mentioned everything, energy, nature, agriculture, farm to fork, um, the green change globally, so the campaigning at a global level, uh, homes, uh, the um, financial sector, sustainable finance, very important, very topical, also in Indonesia, um, etc. So all of that is was launched in 2019 when uh, Commission, uh, Pres Commission President von der Leyen started, and ever since has been uh, rolled out. And I think we can say with some pride uh, that we are on track um, rolling this out. Uh, we will come back to that in the course of my um, talk. The very central, and that's, I go to slide, uh, the next slide. Very central, of course, is everything that relates to, to carbon, carbon emissions, to the Paris Accord of 2015, uh, about in which uh, the um, multilateral partners agreed to cut carbon and in order to make, uh, to contain global warming, warming uh, to at most two uh, degrees centigrade and preferably one and a half degree centigrade. So climate and, and um, the central and cutting CO2 is part of that. Uh, where do we stand at the moment uh, as far as the, our performance in the EU? Uh, not too bad, um, uh, one can say. Um, our uh, reduction up to now um, in uh, 2020 compared to 1990, and I stress that benchmark year, um, is 33%. And we're on continuing to be on a downward trend. Why do I stress 1990? Because, of course, back in 1990, our economy was smaller. Uh, than it is now, 
Um, in other words, our benchmark is tougher um, uh, uh, because of that and considerably tougher than countries that take the year 2005 as their benchmark year, and most countries do. But we've talked, uh, chosen that um, early benchmark year and we are successfully on our way uh, to our goal. We come in the second two uh, the goals. Um, renewable energy, um, <clears throat> a doubling of um, the share of renewables in our energy mix um, over the past uh, 18 years. And uh, we now stand at overall at 22% um, of the energy consumed. And this is only 10% um, under the target that we have in 2030. So it's 20, which is uh, 32%. So that looks good as well. Um, for electricity, I can say, uh, the realization is considerably higher. Uh, we there stand already at 37 and a half percent of renewable electricity um, in uh, the European Union. And lastly, the very important criterion is energy efficiency. The best energy is the energy that you don't use. That's the best solution for cutting carbon. And there um, we are um, uh, only 3% removed from the 2020 energy target. Um, uh, um, uh, so uh, this slide is very vague now. And um, uh, so, uh, and we are um, uh, well ahead uh, of the uh, of the, uh, uh, the the trajectory to get us to the target uh, uh, in twenty thirty. And here, of course, we got a push in the back, if you like, um, as a result of the Russian war against Ukraine and Russian use, Russia's use of energy as a weapon against us. And basically they cut off the tap, the gas, gas pipelines um, uh, to the EU. And we had to cut our gas usage very rapidly. And uh, that's what we did. Um, so that is in terms of our performance um, up to now. Next slide, please. Let's look at, um, at some of the um, uh, progress in terms of the, uh, the, the rollout of our policy measures uh, under the Green Deal. Uh, we've subdivided in, uh, in seven topics, um, sorry, five topics here. Uh, I will be very, very succinct. Uh, there is a, tr a tremendous wealth of information behind each and every of these topics. Um, but I, I, in, I will be uh, brief. The first very important, probably the most important was and is uh, the, um, uh, the cutting carbon. And, um, and especially we have done so very successfully thanks to our emissions trading system. It's a, basically, you must imagine it as a, as a market, a marketplace in which uh, people who want to pollute uh, can buy uh, pollution emissions certificates and, sh and, and shares um, from people who have earned such shares thanks to uh, climate-friendly investments. Now, that system has been around for almost three decades. It has seen its up and ups and downs, but we can now safely say and that this has been a, the big game changer for the European Union industry's energy, um, uh, renewable energy investments. Um, it wasn't finished uh, really um, up to recently, um, there were a number of sectors in the economy of industry that were not 
covered by the European um, tra the emissions trading system, meaning that certain industries could still produce as in the past without any regard to um, emissions. Now that was changed uh, recently. I mean, and now we can say that the trading system covers and basically the entirety of the economy of the European Union, uh, meaning that we have expanded uh, our market uh, for uh, emissions trading and we have um, uh, are quickly um, expanding also the investment in um, uh, CO2 um, emission cuts uh, throughout uh, the, the system investment in decarbonization. Um, we've also um, taken measures to avoid what we call carbon leakage, uh, which by which we mean that uh, companies uh, uh, sneak out of um, uh, decarbonization requirements uh, by going to other markets and by uh, re-importing goods uh, into our market, and um, we um, have uh, um, connected this also uh, to uh, the uh, uh, to the energy sector. So that's a, a, a tremendous um, uh, development. Um, linked to that, I mentioned our um, um, external uh, trade and investment. Of course, um, we have. The fact that we were investing so much in decarbonization in the EU um, is, is great, of course, but it was hindered at times by the fact that um, carbon intensive products and imports continue to come into the European Union. And that created an unfair competition uh, with uh, green products. And it, of course, undermines our our objectives of cutting carbon for the entirety of the economy. Uh, in other words, we have are busy putting in place uh, the so-called carbon border adjustment mechanism, which is a system whereby we uh, compensate um, uh, the gap that exists if, if dirty products, uh, CO2 intensive products uh, come into a market and have this unfair competitive edge. So this is something that we are rolling out right now. It's not yet finished. It's still on the discussion. Um, it can be a little bit complex how we do it, but the bottom line is that this is not a tax or a tariff, but it is a, uh, a levy on uh, carbon intensive products um, <clears throat> that uh, are placed on our market. Um, our third country partners, including Indonesia, have, have put some question marks uh, um, uh, um, about this, uh, this mechanism, um, as they have um, asked, um, uh, asked us to particularly care uh, for the non-discriminatory um, uh, character of this uh, system. And uh, we have hopefully uh, reassured them uh, on that. I move on to the next element of the Green Deal, the progress, and that's um, um, also to do with, um, uh, with energy in particular, and that is the um, boosting the renewable energy sector. There's been fast progress there over the past um, um, decade or so. Uh, we have become um, in, in the world leader in uh, offshore wind power, um, um, by far uh, the biggest uh, uh, world uh, wind power um, producer offshore. And we have also moved very fast on uh, installing rooftop uh, solar panels. Uh, if you are, travel around Europe and you will see many, many housing um, estates and individual housing, whether it's in the cities or outside, uh, uh, covered by uh, solar panels and their contribution to the uh, um, energy mix has also been extremely uh, strong. And, um, and more for the coming 10 years or so, 
is, is the hydrogen strategy uh, where our ambition is to, by the year 2030, to produce 10 million tons of renewable hydrogen and to also import 10 million tons from, um, from wherever we can find it. And that could be uh, close by um, in countries like uh, Algeria or Egypt, uh, but it could also be further away, uh, including in Asia, including um, uh, Southeast Asia, including um, Indonesia. Uh, so this is something we are actively exploring now. And hydrogen, as you know, is produced basically by using water and uh, reacting uh, the components of water uh, in a, a particular um, uh, chemical, electrochemical process. Um, there is no CO2 release, neither in the production um, nor in the use uh, and burning of, uh, of uh, hydrogen. So this is certainly a very, very attractive option for greening your economy. I should stress uh, that I'm talking here about what we call green hydrogen. That is to say, hydrogen that is made with renewable energy, renewable electricity. There's also, of course, hyd hydrogen um, produced with, with non-renewable electricity, but that is not considered renewable hydrogen. Um, in our system. Um, lastly, um, uh, on this page, uh, under element two, the energy efficiency agenda, uh, we are ahead of our target, uh, which is great. Uh, we cut uh, in the past six months, our gas consumption by almost 20%, both industry and households, of course, this was the force of circumstance. Uh, we were at risk of, uh, of a gas crisis uh, because of the Russian um, uh, gas uh, supply cut against us. Um, but the amazing thing is that um, uh, the households and the industry um, reacted in a way that nobody had really expected um, uh, um, how well it went and how fast. And so we, while maintaining our uh, economic growth uh, and avoiding a, an economic recession, uh, we cut um, gas uh, consumption. Next slide, please. Moving on to, uh, uh, to um, pollution. Uh, and here, let, let me just mentioned a couple of things, and that is um, uh, relating to, uh, where am I now? Um, the um, um, circular economy, uh, where we have developed uh, a strategy for, um, for uh, doing that, for reducing waste in our economy, for reusing it, and um, for um, uh, avoiding waste, um, all uh, some very um, important um, um, dimensions. So uh, we want to reduce less rubbish, and what what the rubbish we produce, we want to uh, recycle it and um, reuse it. So there's a whole series of um, measures put in place for that. Uh, 35 of them. Um, you can all find them on the website, but uh, the bottom line is that we want to make sure that our products, the products we use, are sustainable, that they last longer, that they can be repaired rather than uh, dumped um, at an early uh, point in their uh, lifetimes, and that um, we want uh, them to be reused and recycled in uh, the industry. Um, very basic common sense sort of activities that are good both for the environment and for reducing CO2, as well as good for the, uh, the wallet of the uh, uh, consumer. Um, much of this has to do with uh, raising awareness amongst the consumers. Uh, that is true in Europe, that's also true in Indonesia. You see that's also growing in this country, I believe. 
uh, the rise of uh, uh, the number in the number of um, shops and 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 uh, municipalities where single use plastic bags aren't allowed any longer is is tremendous and that has i think created a whole new um, sensitivity amongst consumers uh, for this uh, problem so my um, i would just say carry on with that work and and uh, participate all of us in in that uh, uh, campaign a very um important uh, dimension is also on batteries um, batteries are omnipresent these days and not just in electric vehicles but in everything we use from our mobile phones to uh, uh, the systems the remote controls etc uh, in uh, in our houses um, but batteries of course are highly polluting um, if you dump them into the into the um, waste um, basket um, unsorted and unrecycled uh, uh, so this is an absolute must uh, has has been for us to make sure that old batteries get back into the factories where they come from and are being reused and, and reutilized um, a very important uh, thing where i th i think uh, indonesia and or jakarta still has some work to do uh, on that score and certainly some european models can 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 work here very critical is the role of the municipalities in pushing this um i move on to the next element uh, that is the agriculture side um, farm to fork um, in indonesia there's a similar notion uh, from as well in make, trying to make sure that the supply chain of agro, uh, agriculture, agro-food is sustainable, is healthy, and, and is environmentally friendly. And here, very important for us has been, in the past year, particularly uh, the reduction of the use of, um, of pesticides, um, where we have set new and very tight targets uh, to reduce the, the, uh, the pesticides by 50% or so halving of, uh, of chemical pesticides by the year 2030. And that um, is, of course, not yet the end goal, uh, but the secondary goal is to move from chemical pesticides and to uh, natural pesticides as much as, uh, as uh, possible. And it is, this is, of course, not easy because uh, it involves a, a change of, um, of agricultural habits uh, in the farms, um, in the um, greenhouses and what have you, uh, in, in fisheries as well, uh, the fish farms, where uh, we all have to um, adapt to, uh, to new standards, new norms in order to make this work. And uh, that is uh, for which we have um, about eight years uh, left. The next item is, um, is about ecosystems and biodiversity. Um, and here we come to um, something that is very uh, topical in Indonesia, and that is the, uh, uh, the deforestation free uh, uh, products, commodities, uh, law, uh, draft law, I should say, um, of the EU, um, which is being finalized right now and, sh and sh should come into force um, by the end of 2024. Um, what is this law about? Uh, it basically says that um, any product can come into the EU and uh, uh, on condition that they have not been the cause of uh, deforestation. In other words, we want to make sure that European consumers' uh, consumption uh, does not lead uh, to deforestation. Now, how do you uh, test that? How do you judge that? It's quite simple, really. Uh, first of all, we have talk, taken a a, um, a benchmark year for measuring deforestation 
and that year or the date uh, is uh, 31st December 2020. So everything that happened up to 2020, all trees that were cut before um, at the end of 2020, we don't care about those. That's historical deforestation. Um, it's uh, something that is, you, you, you may criticize it, but it's not something we are interested in for, uh, for our purposes. We look instead at the current period after uh, from the start of 2021 onwards. And um, in other words, we are looking at present policies of countries, uh, we're looking at the present uh, behavior and conduct of companies, of producers um, in, um, in our exporting uh, partner uh, countries. So it's, um, what does it concern? It doesn't concern every product, it concerns products that according to science, have always tended to lead uh, most to uh, deforestation. And there you come to products that are very important for Indonesia, also for Malaysia, uh, like palm oil, uh, timber and timber products, furniture, uh, rubber, uh, coffee and uh, cocoa. Uh, so this morning I had a a very long meeting, a very good meeting, I should also say, at, uh, uh, at uh, one of the ministries, the Ministry of Agriculture, with stakeholders from uh, these sectors uh, in order to allow us to present um, this new legislation and also to obtain uh, observations, comments, concerns uh, from the side of the industry um, in, about uh, what the EU is going to do. So there is some preparatory work to be done, that's clear. Uh, but on the whole, my sense is that this can be made to work uh, in Indonesia uh, for the very simple reason that the large majority of producers in your country have not been cutting forest um, uh, in any way uh, uh, already for uh, some time going back into the past. So the benchmark year of um, the 31st uh, date, sorry, of 31st December 2020 is not a problem for them at all. And the problem is will be more in the implementation, making sure that this can uh, be um, easy to manage uh, by producers, that the paperwork isn't big, and that we're not uh, duplicating things that others have already asked. In other words, the challenge is uh, an efficient way and cost-effective way of implementing all of this. But I think we are uh, uh, keen, uh, certainly from our side, we are keen to cooperate with the, the government and with the um, uh, producers um, in the various um, uh, associations. Um, good. I, um, this brings me naturally to, uh, uh, to the next topic in my presentation and that next slide, please. And uh, that is why we aren't banning palm oil. And, um, and the first answer is, we aren't banning palm oil because we are importing palm oil. Year after year, um, the EU has been importing uh, palm oil, um, you know, sizable quantities. We are not your biggest consumer of palm oil, but we are about uh, 15 or so percent of, um, of your exports. Uh, but it is 2 billion euros um, in uh, 2021. So this, and that amount is quite steady. There are some market price um, fluctuations, mostly in favor of, uh, of, uh, of Indonesia, uh, of course, especially in the past um, year or so. Um, the EU has a very low import tariff uh, for, uh, for palm oil. Um, much of it enters our market at 0% uh, import duty, so nothing. 
and only over and above a certain level, a certain quota, uh, there is a 10% um, import duty. And that makes us by far the op most open markets uh, market uh, for palm oil in, in, in the world. And, and that is also quite simply explained by the fact that we need palm oil and our industry wants palm oil. Um, many products um, are made um, uh, with palm oil. Um, it's not just for cooking, uh, but it's also for soap, for cosmetics, for uh, plastics, and for many, many uh, consumer products. Somebody told me that um, an analysis had shown that if you go into a European supermarket, that there are unpacked products like lettuce and, and oranges, and there's packed products. And that the packed products in European supermarket, 60%, 60% have something of palm oil in their uh, ingredients are made of palm oil or made with palm oil. Now that is massive and just goes to show and that European Union will wish to um, continue importing palm oil um, in, uh, in the future. And um, I, for completeness sake, I do mention the last bullet there and anti, the EU has an anti-subsidy measure against Indonesian biodiesel. Um, this was uh, based on uh, a complaint from our industry uh, not uh, particularly the sunflower and soil industry, who said that Indonesian biodiesel was getting unfair advantages because of subsidization. And uh, that complaint was, uh, uh, was an, an analyzed by the European Commission. And the European Commission found that this was a, um, the, the, the complaint was founded, well founded. And for that reason, there's an anti subsidy measure which has leveled this unfair competition and has again create a, a equal um, a level playing field. Um, next slide, please. Now, if that, if that is all true, what I've just said, then why, what's all the, all the commotion about in, in the Indonesian media? Um, and um, in, in to some extent also in, in the politics. And um, it has, it's a bit technical, and, uh, but it has to do with two aspects. First of all, it has to do with biodiesel made um, of uh, or with uh, palm oil. And in our legislation for our renewable energy uh, sector, um, palm oil based biodiesel is current not considered sustainable from a uh, perspective of the impact it has or has had uh, on land use change. And land use change in, is uh, in simple terms, it means uh, deforestation for the sake of uh, uh, expanding uh, palm oil plantations. So that is our, uh, our position based on scientific evidence. Um, and what does this mean in practice? It does not mean that there is a going to be, that there is a ban on palm oil uh, uh, in biofuels or that there will be a ban, not at all. Uh, but the change will be that in the year 2030 and onwards, member states uh, cannot count uh, palm oil based biodiesel as part of their obligation under. Uh, to uh, introduce renewable energy. They cannot subsidize uh, re that renewable energy or support it in, in any, any way any longer from that year onwards. Um, now, Indonesia, as well as Malaysia, um, has taken us to, uh, to the WTO uh, for this measure, for this policy. They say it is discriminatory and that the science that we claim um, is not um, uh, correct. 
and the suit is still pending before the WTO and we have to wait and see what it uh, what the outcome what the verdict will will, will be um, but the bottom line and I keep stressing that is whatever comes out of the WTO it will not mean that there, that there is a ban is going to be a ban uh, or um, uh, on uh, biodiesel made with uh, palm oil. Uh, next slide, please. And um, the second, that is, this is about the second piece of legislation I have already referred to, and that is the deforestation free commodities. Uh, palm oil is the biggest one uh, that we import from Indonesia. Uh, but there are also others. You can see that in the slide there. Um, we, in total, we have a uh, um, the uh, the share of uh, of commodities um, is uh, it's sixty percent of the commodities we import from Indonesia is palm oil, followed by timber, quite important, rubber, and coffee, as well as um, the smaller. Lands, cocoa, beef, and soy. Um, so this is the uh, um, what we're talking about, um, and we are, what we're saying is that these commodities we want to continue buying them, but only if they do not uh, cause deforestation. Our consumption should not uh, lead to the destruction of of your forest. Uh, so. It's about therefore about creating deforestation free supply chains. That's the next slide. Deforestation free supply chains uh, to ensure that uh, the goods that we put on the EU market uh, will not contribute to deforestation any longer. And um, whether it's in the forest in the EU or elsewhere in the world. Um, very important to stress once again that this is not about banning certain products from our market. No, um, it isn't. Um, it is um, um, banning certain products uh, from our market, uh, not allowing them to be sold on our market if they do not meet certain, certain rules. And um, we uh, are not going to blacklist countries or products at all. Uh, we're going to work on a consignment uh, basis. So the consignments that come from into the EU market on um, um, from um, uh, Indonesia or elsewhere, they need to be um, uh, green and sustainable. They need to uh, have evidence that they are not uh, the, the cause of, uh, of deforestation. And then um, this is um, any products uh, uh, of the, the ones that I've mentioned can be sold legally on our market. And very important to stress also is that uh, this, um, there is not going to be any discrimination um, the, our rules apply not only to what comes on our market from outside, uh, but also uh, what is um, produced on our own uh, soil. In other words, commodities, soy or beef produced in the EU, uh, they also must not have uh, led to um, deforestation. Um, Next slide, and that's the last slide. Where does this leave um, um, Indonesia? Where does this leave uh, the EU-Indonesia uh, relations? And because uh, uh, we know, I know very well that it's, it's one thing for us to adopt lo laws and, and then ask others to help the implementation. Um, uh, but you need cooperation to make that um, uh, happen. You need understanding from your partners for what you're doing. And um, also you need to uh, try to convince the benefits that uh, your partner, your trade partner has uh, in, 
in cooperation with us uh, on these on these files. Now, how do we do that? Uh, we have uh, quite quite some um, uh, set of uh, dialogue platforms between Indonesia and us. There's an environment and climate change working group. We have a palm oil working group. We have um, the flagged voluntary partnership agreement, which is um, an agreement uh, that uh, has, uh, to put it in simple terms, has created a green lane uh, into the EU for legal Indonesian timber. Quite successful since 2016. Uh, Indonesia is the only country that has uh, has has achieved this and has got uh, such a um, a um, uh, an agreement with with the EU. Um, <clears throat> then, of course, we will um, continue to work with the government and also the private sector to help uh, work out a scheme uh, for legality and deforestation free requirements to which I've just referred. Um, I, the meeting this morning in the agriculture manager ministry was was the first in um, in that uh, context. Um, we're going to roll out some new um, support schemes uh, to help Indonesia and other partner countries to um, um, improve forest governance where it is needed, um, or to create a more comparability between us and um, and our partners so that uh, the exchanges can happen more uh, easily. Um, we're also starting a um, new technical assistance facility also to uh, help especially the, the uh, industry um, adapt to uh, the new market uh, rules of the EU. And lastly, I, sh I did want to mention that we're working with Indonesia on the uh, the Just Energy Transition Partnership, which um, uh, President uh, Widodo um, agreed with the G7 and other uh, partners uh, in the margin of the Bali uh, G20 summit last year. Uh, the EU is, uh, is, and several member states are part of that um, as well. Uh, we are in the International Partner Group and we expect SEU to um, finance the um, JetP uh, with a loan from the European Investment Bank up to 1 billion uh, euros. All right, that concludes my talk. And um, the last page is um, the contact details, the Twitters, the I IGs, the FBs, the YTs, et cetera. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Ambassador, for uh, very insightful and informative uh, information to, for uh, all the participants and also uh, your course. Uh, I have made uh, some uh, notes uh, for this uh, presentation, and then first is uh, related to Green Deal uh, policy. We have uh, actually, there are so many aspects, but yes, we talk about the uh, palm oil in this aspect. And then uh, there are three points uh, as the indicator for uh, EU here, uh, CO, CO2 emission cuts, and then looks like uh, it's a positive trend uh, in this uh, case. And then also about the renewable energy and then uh, international situation to influence uh, the condition about renewable energy, especially uh, when we have uh, to face uh, the conflict between Russia and Ukraine. And then, yes, uh, we know for some energy supply, uh, European Union uh, supplied by uh, Russia. And then uh, some notes also uh, from this uh, explanation to, uh, about. Uh, the challenge for uh, European uh, Green Deal, yes, yes, international situation, the supply of uh, renewable energy, and then it's also challenging. Uh, it, uh, the AU tried to find the source of uh, renewable uh, energy to decrease uh, the uh, 
uh, the uh, what what we call is uh, energy supply from Russia. And then uh, related to uh, palm oil, uh, I made a note that uh, palm oil is not a banned uh, because uh, AU still import it. Yes, uh, in 2017, uh, there is a resolution uh, from uh, European Union Parliament related to uh, palm oil. And then uh, it also influenced uh, the palm oil industry uh, in Indonesia. And they try to make uh, some uh, adjust related to uh, the policy of uh, of or the regulation uh, from European Union. And then um, I, I also made some note uh, that uh, the ambassador uh, state that there is unfair uh, from Indonesian palm oil uh, related to subsidize uh, and then uh, in, uh, related to WTO uh, regulation, uh, it against uh, the anti subsidy measure that, uh, and now, uh, Indonesia and Malaysia already bring it uh, to WTO uh, in this put settlement body of uh, WTO and uh, we wait uh, for this uh, the development mm -hmm. of this uh, issue and then uh, and uh, goes to another notes uh, the important notes are from uh, the ambassador uh, picket uh, related to this palm oil there is a no ban uh, no ban uh, special ban actually it applies equally uh, the product which is come from AU or other countries uh, outside uh, from AU no ban and then also uh, no discrimination and the last uh, the last note is about the corporation and assistance uh, we believe uh, what uh, AU uh, policy will influence uh, all uh, the country, will influence uh, many countries, especially for Indonesia and Malaysia, because uh, two countries are uh, the main uh, producer of uh, palm oil. Okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Uh, Ambassador, uh, for once again for very insightful and informative information, especially about the current situation uh, related uh, to this uh, issue. Uh, okay, uh, we are going to continue in the next session, uh, Q and answer. Okay. But before uh, we uh, start the question from uh, other participants, I would like to ask uh, to uh, Mr. Ambassador uh, related to uh, palm oil. Uh, you said before, you mentioned before uh, that uh, the position of uh, AU uh, based on scientific uh, approach. Yes, uh, you mentioned that before, but uh, for some situations, uh, I uh, I found some information that it uh, that is uh, there is a sustainable produce palm uh, that the industry of palm oil in Indonesia also provide a scientific uh, approach uh, related uh, this that uh, provide uh, some uh, well, different uh, different approach uh, with uh, AU statement related to this. Uh, they say that uh, palm-based uh, ingredients are uh, have a high nutritional benefit, and then also uh, palm uh, palm oil is the most uh, resource efficient oil in the world. And then uh, uh, the two, uh, the second uh, is a palm uh, production actually can be environmentally uh, friendly. Uh, it is uh, not really like just uh, the ambassador uh, state uh, sixty percent of deforestation to uh, come or provoke by uh, the palm oil industry. Maybe you can uh, give some opinion uh, related uh, to uh, the current situation uh, in Indonesia or in Malaysia about the scientific approach, uh, proof, uh, scientific approach provided by the palm oil industry in Indonesia. That is the first uh, question. Uh, the second question, uh, Mr. Ambassador, uh, you know, uh, AU is uh, the three biggest economic power with uh, the United States and then also China uh, and uh, more than 50% of uh, what trading. Uh, we knew that uh, this is in the AU region. And of course, all the policy, all uh, the policy made uh, in AU uh, will influence uh, many countries uh, in the yeah, many countries uh, in every region, in Asia, in Africa, or uh, in Europe itself. And uh, what is your opinion uh, related to uh, the Green Deal? Uh, what will happen or what will influence especially uh, the government policy uh, in, the, in the ASEAN, for example, uh, 
uh, related to uh, this uh, issue, Mr. Ambassador. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Reni. Um, for these questions, first of all, the questions about the science behind uh, the EU policy and and our scientists believe that they are right, and and yours, the Indonesian scientists believe that they are right, and uh, I, you know, I'm um, at a loss <laughs> uh, to say uh, who is right um, from a scientific point of view, and and I think the fact that the the outcomes for the scientific analyses were so different. Uh, between us and um, and Indonesia, um, that me meant that Indonesia um, decided to to go uh, and start a, a a a case with the WTO against us. Now, what I can say is that this matter is extremely complex, uh, very complex uh, to study and to come to conclusions, and. It's not surprising, uh, therefore, that uh, the, um, the WTO has, has taken already more than three years uh, to uh, come to a conclusion itself. And uh, that's not for, for ill will on their side, uh, but it's just uh, a, a very difficult matter. Uh, so, uh, so we'll have to be a little bit more patient still, and uh, we, we would like to hear the result as well. Uh, but um, uh, we just have to wait until the WTA comes comes through with their with their ruling. Um, but let me stress very strongly that um, <clears throat> we know as as European lawmaker, and and it's the same in Indonesia that. If you use science, then you must, you know, from from to the best of your knowledge, be on safe grounds. And uh, otherwise, if you don't do that, if you accept uh, shaky science, then of course you're asking trouble for yourself, um, either from a scientific point of view or in the law court. And uh, so, uh, what I mean to say is that uh, we are absolutely acting in good faith in, in this matter, and there's no um, intentional um, discrimination by the EU lawmaker against anybody or anything, and that whatever we have produced is based on uh, the conviction that the science was right. So that is, uh, that is I think, the best answer I can give uh, to you, um, then um, yeah, the, the European Union as as standard setter, uh, not just for ourselves but also for our trading partners, and and but also by, for uh, even countries and regions beyond our trading partners. Uh, yeah, that is that is true that we have that role in in uh, many respects, for two reasons. Uh, one. We are big, uh, we are uh, 27 countries, uh, 450 million uh, people, and we are about you know, 18 or so, 18, 18% of the world economy. As we have very close economic relations with many countries around the, the EU, um, meaning that those countries almost automatically uh, will accept the EU rules uh, as theirs, simply because it is pragmatic. And uh, but also in other parts of the world, uh, you will you see the same phenomenon. Um, one very good example is the uh, uh, the uh, European Union's rules for data protection, uh, the G GDPR. General Data Protection Regulation, um, which has also been used not as a model, uh, but as a 
a source of know-how, a source of uh, uh, best practice or, or practice for uh, also used in Indonesia. And um, so clearly the, the lawmaker here, the ministry, the government and the parliament liked uh, the way we did it and took much of this for the Indonesian legislation as well. And for um, the green agenda, you can imagine the same uh, easily. Example, uh, carbon pricing and the emission trading system. Now, your economy is different from ours, evidently. Uh, so you, you can't photocopy things, uh, you know, uh, from one to the other, just like that. But um, what is what you can do is study how the EU emission trading system has worked, uh, what the, the strong points are, and what the difficult points are for for your country, and then apply it, uh, apply what fits here, and that can be extremely uh, uh, useful and practical and fast. Um, other example, uh, the EU from the year 2026 will require all uh, producers of electronic equipment uh, to use one single standard for charges. Um, you and I have all uh, had repeatedly this problem when you have one phone requiring one, one charger, another phone a different charger, and uh, uh, something else at home, um, you have yet another charger. So it's very annoying for the customer and it is very polluting unnecessarily. There's no added value in, in all these different standards. Now, the EU has said from 2026 onwards, no new electrical equipment comes on our market uh, unless it has this one uniform standard charging system. And now that is a very simple measure. And I think that this could be copied very, very easily into other countries' legislation as well. You do the job uh, very quickly and you, you, you benefit from uh, the, the field work that was done in, in by, by European lawmakers and, and you do your job faster than you would, would otherwise have. Uh, uh, very last point on the Green Deal. Yes, uh, we are uh, um, uh, a standard setter because we are, in many respects, we are the first and we are the most advanced. And that's a fact. Uh, I, we have been greening our economy gradually uh, for now a good uh, three, if not four decades. And that is that means that in, in many respects we are, are leading this debate and um, which is which is good. We are, we're proud of it in a sense, of course. It all also is, is difficult because you always have to do the, um, uh, the first mover uh, work. And uh, of course, there is, uh, uh, that takes an effort, uh, but, but okay, that's, if that's what it takes, we will do it. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh... Mr. Ambassador, for your response uh, to my uh, questions. Okay, uh, let's continue to next uh, Q&A session. Uh, but uh, before that, I would like to inform there will be uh, two uh, rounds of uh, Q&A session, uh, first session. Uh, I will read it uh, from the chat box. Uh, I saw that a uh, few questions, uh, some questions already uh, sent in chat box. And then uh, the second, uh, I will uh, ask the audience, uh, you may ask uh, directly and you may raise hand uh, for the next uh, second session of this uh, Q&A uh, Q session. Okay, uh, let me uh, read uh, the question in chat box. Okay. okay. Uh, first question, uh, Mr. Ambassador from Steve Harrison. Okay. This is related to international assistance 
from uh, the AU since I mentioned before uh, everything uh, the AU's policy will influence uh, many countries. Here, Steve Harrison uh, uh, questioned Indonesia AU Green Deal becoming a global norm for more sustainable planet. Is there any policy assistance program for developing and least uh, developed countries uh, to arrange the similar one? Okay, I will men I will read uh, around uh, uh, three questions first, and then uh, the second questions uh, from Almas Pratama. Okay. Uh, he asked about uh, is there any additional certification uh, for certain products yeah, uh, to enter the AU's market? So there is a certification or not uh, cert, uh, for, uh, for any products yeah, to enter the AU's uh, market. So they can enter AU's market and then uh, provide uh, what uh, the AU's qualification. And then uh, from uh, Okay, uh, this is from Baskoro uh, related to WTO rules. Um, has AU made a study about the compliance of this uh, regulation, especially the forestation, uh, the forestation uh, to supply the WTO rules such as uh, TBT, technical barriers to trade agreement? Okay, maybe for the first uh, for session, uh, I will. I only read the four or three questions. Okay, please, uh, Mr. Ambassador, you may respond to the question. Thank you. Um, the uh, first question, like Harrison, if I heard well, uh, about policy assistance program. Yes, we have some some uh, program like, like that. Uh, here at my mission, we uh, we have uh, we implement that. So uh, the um, there is. Um, it, it, money available for um, for helping policy development um, in between us. There's also a possibility for support to companies to uh, adapt to new uh, standards on the EU market uh, and uh, uh, etc. Et so very hands-on, very straightforward. Um, Indonesia does not receive development aid uh, anymore. Um, uh, those days are over. Uh, you're too rich. Um, uh, you're not a developing, a least developing country uh, any longer. Uh, so the the money for Indonesia is uh, is is modest, but it is it's real, and I think we can do a very good work uh, uh, responding to you know the need the needs we hear from from government. And the needs we hear from uh, from 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 companies and from from civil society. Um, the second question um, from uh, Amas: um, um, Is there going to be any additional certification for uh, the entry of products into our market? Um, no, uh, there won't be. Um, the um, for the deforestation free. A rule. Um, the work has to be done um, not so much by the Indonesia producer uh, or the exporter, but by the European importer. So the importer in, in Europe uh, has to uh, confirm that a product um, is deforestation free. Now that importer, of course, will uh, have to make a, a statement uh, about that, will the importer will need something of evidence uh, from his trade partner in uh, in Indonesia or Malaysia or wherever uh, to make him confident um, that he can make this statement, and then uh, is it is totally um, uh, open uh, to uh, the uh, the working habits of the importer and the exporter how they do that. Now, in most cases in Indonesia, of course, you can uh, rely on the legality evidence that companies have. Uh, a piece of land on which they work uh, is legal um, and production is legal there. And secondly, evidence about deforestation. It can be anything. It can be um, uh, satellite imagery, uh, of which there's plenty around. Uh, 
um, freely accessible by anybody. Uh, you can spot easily uh, whether you're a piece of land in, in uh, central Java uh, province uh, is deforested or, or not, uh, and when that happened. Um, there's the cutoff date, uh, 31st December 2020, was chosen for a very good reason. Uh, namely, that is also the date that is in the SDGs and uh, Sustainable Development Goals that the, the whole world has signed up to, which means that um, all countries and all regions and all big players have been making photographs, uh, satellite photographs uh, of all parts of the world um, to, to uh, measure the situation uh, and fix the situation on that particular point in time. So I think that in itself can already be evidence. And, and people in Indonesia talk a lot about the smallholders. Uh, they're small and they have no capacity for uh, certification and so on. Well, I, I can reassure you, uh, they won't need it. The uh, simple evidence, even um, a, a photograph, a, a geolocated photograph uh, can suffice uh, to show uh, where you are and, and what the situation of the land is and then um, it can be linked to uh, satellite imagery afterwards. So uh, that's the second question. And the last question was about, uh, from Buskara, uh, was about have, have we uh, um, uh, assessed the WTO compliance of our deforestation law, anti-deforestation law? Uh, yes, we have. and. Um, of course, we are, we are not uh, uh, cutting corners here. We know that this is uh, highly sensitive uh, for uh, many of our trade partners. Um, it has large economic and social uh, implications or could have. Uh, so we have to be um, very certain of our case um, uh, before we uh, uh, put uh, a, a piece of legislation into the, uh, into the procedure with the parliament and the member states and so on. Uh, we are very, very certain that what we're doing is non-discriminatory, uh, that it does not create an additional or unnecessary uh, or unacceptable hurdle like um, the, the non-trade ta tariff barriers and um, to trade. Uh, it's about um, market regulation like there is, you know, hundreds of examples in, in any economy. Um, uh, of all sorts of, uh, of all kinds uh, for, for safety, for um, hygiene, for chemicals, for um, veterinary standards, uh, um, et cetera, et cetera. There's hundreds and hundreds of um, laws around also in Indonesia for regulating your market and, and only with certain, if, if producers and importers comply with these norms, they can sell here. So it's uh, this is a standard practice, um, but it is a new way of working uh, around it. And But we are confident that we're on, on very solid ground here. Okay, thank you for, very much, uh, Mr. Ambassador, for uh, answering three uh, questions uh, from uh, Steve and uh, others. Okay, uh, we are going to continue. Uh, let's move to next session uh, of uh, our Q and A session. We will have a direct uh, direct uh, question. There are three students already raised hand. Okay, I will call first uh, for Fabian Adam. Okay. Please, Fabian Adam, uh, if you have any direct question to Mr. Ambassador. Fabian Adam from General Sudirman University, International Relations Department. Okay. The time is yours, Adam. Uh, <coughs> okay, can you hear me clear? Yeah. Okay. First of all, thank you for the chance. Good afternoon. Uh, I would like to ask about the policy of deforestation free palm oil. How does the European Union make sure the demonstration and proof of no deforestation is real and legitimate and not gained by corruption or crime? 
considering many country, including some developing country have a corrupt government and law legitimacy. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and then uh, next uh, question, maybe uh, I I'll call uh, three of them first, uh, Mr. Ambassador, and then you may answer after that, maybe because uh, it, uh, probably some of the questions are similar. Okay, uh, the second question uh, will be to Daniel. Okay, Daniel. Um, okay. Um, can you hear me clearly? Okay, so first of all, thank you so much for Mr. Vincent. Uh, it's such a pleasure to attend your lecture. So my question is, um, palm oil is one of um, the renewable energy and people use it a lot these days. And then with the boom of palm oil users, of course, this, uh, this kind of oil will um, run out too in the future. So maybe is that, is that because the, it cannot be planted again but because of the land uh, that run out of space for planting the palm. Um, before this uh, lecture, uh, I read uh, an interesting article online that said, according to United States Department of Agri Agriculture, Malaysia as second largest producer of palm oil is running out of viable land for palm oil plantation. So my question is, uh, what is uh, your action if the risk of palm oil crisis is really happened? And if Europe didn't ban the use of palm oil, are Europe gonna use strict, uh, gonna strict its use or Europe just gonna let people use palm oil as much as they want? Thank you, sir. Okay. Um, thank you, uh, Daniel. Uh, the last question. Uh from direct question from Aurani, okay. Okay, uh, please Aurani Azania, time is yours to ask. Mr. Ambassador, what is the European Union's response to the notions that the policy to remove palm oil from the biofuel program as a source of renewable energy by Europe is a protectionist threat policy rather than an effort to preserve the environment? Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you uh, for three of you. Uh, I may uh, include here uh, related to the question uh, first from uh, from Adam. It is about corrupt uh, government. Is it uh, legitimate or is it uh, true, uh, the proof uh, that uh, given by such government? Uh, and then uh, the second question uh, from um, Adam also, and then uh, about uh, from Aurani. Uh, related to okay, uh, okay, let's, okay uh, from Aurani, uh, is it protectionist uh, policy rather than a vote to preserve uh, the environment? So it is about also uh, related to WTO uh, policy. Thank you. You may respond with uh, <laughs> Mr. Ambassador. Thank you very much. Bye. Mike, uh, thank you um, for all these uh, three interesting questions. And um, first of all, uh, to, to Adam, yeah, corruption. Uh, corruption is a scourge. And uh, for any country, wherever it exists, and no country is free of corruption. Uh, some have more, some have less, of course, but, but, um, um, but, it is one of the big tasks of, 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 of government to, to make sure that the rules that you, uh, your parliament adopts uh, for your society, for your economy, that they are implemented well and that equitably and honestly. And it's tough uh, at times and uh, there are um, criminal people who, uh, you know, find the uh, the holes in the in 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 the net and um, um, yeah, but you know on the whole, the um, th corruption cases are found out and 
I think we have we have cases of uh, of fraudulent uh, um, certification or documentation uh, and appearing on the EU market. It happens, uh, but um, you can do it as 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 a somebody who commits fraud. You can do that maybe once. Uh, twice at most, but but then it's over. Uh, so it's um, it's a short-lived gain, and uh, but certainly corruption is uh, is uh, is an issue. And if you apply that to uh, uh, to the forest, uh, it's it's a particularly sensitive issue, of course, because uh, the damage that you do as 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 corrupt fraudulent person is is lasting. Uh, the the tree that you cut illegally. And try to export uh, as, as timber or as furniture. Uh, that tree is gone for, for good, and, and it it uh, it hampers, hampers the reputation of your country, uh, the reputation of your forest, and the reputation of your commodity. So, it is uh, certainly something that uh, we all need to work together uh, on uh, in order to weed it out. Uh, question from Daniel about uh, the demand for palm oil going up and uh, land um, land being limited. Uh, so uh, uh, hence you have to cut uh, forests in order to create more land. Um, well, yes and no. Uh, the here analysis here in Indonesia and I think also in. Malaysia continues to be very much that um, improving your um, farming techniques, uh, improving your um, uh, inputs, your seeds, your fertilizers, um, improving your, uh, your workers' skills um, uh, can raise productivity per hectare uh, very, very significantly, and um, and you know, let me focus on Indonesia, where uh, uh, where I am now. Um, but that is certainly very, very true for the for all uh, palm oil plantations in this country, certain the big companies, but especially the smallholders, and then that's I think where still the tremendous growth can 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 uh, can happen um, with uh, with them. Um, uh, in order to meet this greater demand, and uh, and now theoretically, of course, let's uh, demand continues to grow. Your productivity has gone up and has reached the maximum. What then? Um, and yeah, that's where you have a, a policy choice to make um, as government, as as producer. And uh, what do you want for your country? Uh, do you want your to live within the limits? of your natural resources as they are? Um, or do you want to continue uh, with expansion and cut forest and, and damage biodiversity, damage, uh, push a lot of CO2 into the, uh, into the um, uh, atmosphere, um, uh, add to global warming, etc. Now, that is a policy choice and a political choice that uh, every country has to make. And I do think, having been here now three and a half years, that Indonesia has made a choice for itself and has said, uh, we have the Paris Agreement for cutting CO2, limiting global warming. We have made commitments about stopping deforestation completely and um, uh, under, within the framework of the biodiversity and the, what was it? It was the Glasgow, uh, uh, COP26 meeting, uh, where the, uh, the minister was on stage with uh, everybody else uh, signing uh, up to this agreement. So that is a political choice. And uh, of course, as country, as government, uh, you have to live up to that choice and you have to implement it day by day. Uh, so there is an element of politics there uh, where uh, the, the countries have to make up their mind what future they want to create for themselves, for their population, but also for the world. Uh, the last uh, question from uh, Aurani, uh, who was sitting there in this with this uh, <laughs> interesting backdrop. <laughs> Very funny. Uh, 
I'm going to do that as well, something like that. Uh, uh, well, in a way, I have it. <laughs> but, uh, Arani's question um, is the is the renewable energy directive um, um, is it protection protect disguided protectionism? And um, look, two answers. A uh, the jury is out uh, in the sense that. The WTO panel still has to issue its ruling. And once we have it, uh, you have their answer um, uh, to, that, to your question. Uh, uh, the second thing is that uh, we, can, we are convinced that, that this is not about protectionism. Uh, this is about scientific um, drawing policy conclusions based on scientific evidence. Um, Indonesia disputes our evidence, so does Malaysia. So we have to wait and see who, who, uh, who wins the argument and, uh, and take it from there. But, but more fundamentally, of course, what do we protect? Uh, is, what is there to protect in the EU? Are there products on the market uh, that, um, uh, that we wish to protect uh, that can you know, cater to all our demand for vegetable oils? And um, uh, no, there aren't enough such products on our own domestic uh, production. Uh, so we need imports and, uh, uh, for our uh, um, for meeting the demand of vegetable oils. And so there is absolutely no uh, substantive, no market reason for us uh, to, uh, uh, to resort to protectionism of, uh, of whichever product you, you, you wish. We, as I said at the start, uh, we want palm oil, we are importing it, and we wish to continue to import it. And it's, it's this the discussion right now is about how to make that possible in a way that is uh, compatible with other interests, uh, uh, like uh, global warming and stopping deforestation and, and um, promoting sustainability. Okay. Uh, thank you uh, very much uh, for the response uh, related to uh, the question and, uh, by our students and then also uh, from others. Okay, um, I think this is uh, the end of our Q&A session due to time limitation from the committee of uh, the FPCI. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I would like to make uh, some summary before uh, related to the question uh, that uh, the ambassador uh, strengthened about the AU commitment for deforestation that our consumption, our economic activities should not endanger our environment, should not uh, trade our uh, life, our human life, our earth, and uh, all uh, the AU's uh, policy related to AU Green Deal uh, is. Uh, the, observe, the objective is to preserve the environment rather than uh, other uh, goals uh, such as protection trade or others. And um, yes, uh, I'm sorry, we, uh, we have to, uh, yeah, we, I believe this is at uh, the end of the Q&A session. And uh, before uh, we close uh, the Q&A session, uh, let's give applause first. Okay. And uh, Mr. Uh, Ambassador, uh, you please uh, give uh, some uh, closing message for our participants, especially for uh, my beloved students. Some of them are my beloved students uh, related to this uh, topic. The floor well, is so thank, you. thank you. Thank you, uh, uh, Dr. Rennie, for that. And let me, let me thank the, everybody for their attendance and, and uh, I hope that um, um, you have learned something, picked up something from from this, and uh, and uh, and if I if there's two messages, in fact, uh, uh, any one is uh, that you know a thing like climate, global warming, um, a problem of that sort. It you can see it as a global problem, but we all. As individual citizens, we have to see it as an individual problem too. And in our personal lives, uh, we have to 
try and live in a way that uh, makes um, it possible to keep global warming under control and so that, uh, that preserves uh, the beautiful habitat uh, that you have here in Indonesia and in Europe we have not the same but but something similar so it's about all of all up to all of uh, each and every one of us uh, to to make uh, this uh, um, work and the second thing I want to say uh, Ibrani is I look forward to visiting you and your uh, colleagues and your students uh, at uh, Universitas uh, General uh, Sudirman um, in in the coming in the coming months. So I look forward to that opportunity. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Ambassador. Okay, um, at, at the end of the closing message of uh, Mr. Ambassador, uh, I may hand over. Okay, we continue to the next session the closing session of this webinar. I may hand over this uh, to Mbak Afni as the MC of uh, this uh, webinar. Hello, Mbak Afni. Yes. Okay. Hello. Thank you, Ibu Reni, for moderating the discussion. And thank you, Ambassador Picard, for the presentation and fruitful discussion. Uh, I hope everybody enjoyed the discussion and learned one, two, or many things yes, on course. EU Green Deal from the EU ambassador himself. Now let's take some group photo. I invite everybody to turn on their camera and make your good pose. Are we good to start? So in three, two, one, smile. Hold on once again. Three, two, one. One last time. Three, two, one. Okay, we are good. That concludes our lecture today. Thank you very much, Ambassador, and thank you, thank you for very much who are joining our discussion from YouTube and also from the Zoom. And just a reminder for all the students joining from the Zoom, kindly fill in the attendance list uh, shared to you in the chat box. And of course, see you again in the next Ambassador Lecture. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador.